Welcome to Drive Safer, a very special episode of Drive TV. I'm your host, Trent Nikolic, and with me is somebody that most of you will know, Ian Luff. It's a real privilege to have you here because you have spent the majority of your life helping Australians drive safer. Well, that's right, Trent. And uh, in those uh, 40 years of running my own business, I guess you'd say I've seen it all before. <laughs> yeah. And as we know, most people think that they're good drivers, but thinking you're good is one thing. But when we look at statistics, we've seen a 3% increase just in this year alone in motor vehicle accidents. So the system is partially wrong, and I think we've got to have a hard look at how we can make people better and safer drivers. And that's why in this episode of Drive TV, we're going to focus on safety fundamentals, whether it's your daily driving, whether it's towing, even things like safely packing your vehicle. That's what we're here to focus on. Well, it's a great subject, and when you start talking about driving, I mean, most people think they're experts. <laughs> I mean, if we go back to the fundamentals of how we got a driver's licence, as we know, reverse park, three-point turn, a lap round the block on a yep. sunny day, if that, and, uh, and Bob's your uncle. So I really think that we've got to take the subject of driving a lot more seriously, and if we're going to uh, arrest the road toll, governments need to take a bigger responsibility in how a licence is obtained. Absolutely no doubt about that, Ian, and it's been Drive's position for some time that increased driver awareness and driver skills and increased training makes for safer drivers on the road. So let's dive right into it. Strap yourselves in because the next hour of Drive TV could help you save your life. views are out of this world. This thing is unbelievable. It sounds incredible. Golly gee, everybody. Look at that. Welcome to Drive Safer. On this episode, we're going to give you a thorough understanding of the basic fundamental tips that you need to know to make sure you can take off on your next road trip in safety. Whether it's new car technology, tires, towing, or even the safest way to pack your vehicle, we'll tell you everything you need to know so you can hit the road with your family, and most importantly, do it safely. At Drive TV and over at drive.com.au, we've obviously tested hundreds in fact, thousands of cars, hundreds of cars every year. And even though the average Australian buyer doesn't put safety right at the top of their buying priority, we put a huge amount of importance on safety systems. Now, you've heard us mention things like radar cruise control, blind spot monitoring, lane keep assist. But I'd wager that most of you don't know exactly what those safety systems do. And some of you might have been a little bit reluctant to delve into them. Now, a brand like Volvo is synonymous with safety. So when you buy a brand new Volvo, you expect it to be a safe vehicle. This competes in the medium luxury SUV class. It's one of our favorites from any brand in any segment. And unsurprisingly, it comes with a five-star ANCAP safety rating. So that's the first point. Any vehicle that's got a five-star ANCAP rating, you know it's safe for you and your family. But the electronic safety systems inside this Volvo are incredible. There's a lot of them. I've gone to one of our most recent reviews so I don't forget any of them. Now, autonomous emergency braking, that's something that you've heard us talk about a lot, but Volvo calls theirs city support and it includes pedestrian, cyclist and large animal detection along with intersection detection, braking and steering assistance. So it doesn't just put the brakes on when you need it to, it does a whole range of other things as well. There's traffic sign recognition, rain sensing wipers, a 360 degree camera system, which is fantastic and gives you a top down view of the car when you're parking it, so you know you're positioning it exactly where you want. Basic safety like front and rear parking sensors and then more intelligent safety like adaptive cruise control with an adjustable speed limiter, pilot assist semi-autonomous driving, oncoming lane mitigation, runoff mitigation, park assist, blind spot monitoring and rear cross traffic alert. Now, all of those things sound very complex and we'll take a simple look at a couple of them in a minute. But there's also something called Intelligent Driver Information System, which you might not even notice is operating in the background. So that keeps an eye on you as the driver to make sure that you're paying attention to what's going on in the world around you. 
you get the point that there's a lot of active and passive safety that's going on in this new Volvo while you're driving it. How do they work in the real world and what do they do for you behind the wheel? Let's take an entry level look at a couple of the basic systems. Now the first system that we'll take a beginner's look at is radar cruise control and adaptive cruise control. Each manufacturer has slightly different ways of doing it, but we find when we speak to people who've never driven a vehicle with it and then bought a new vehicle that has it, they say to us they'll never go back to a vehicle that doesn't have active cruise control. Now, in principle, what it does, if you remember old cruise control systems, you're on the highway, let's say you set the limit at 110. If the vehicle in front of you starts to slow down, you will close up on it because the system is not intelligent enough to have picked up that the car in front of you has slowed down. With a modern system that is adaptive, it can slow down and speed back up, up to the limit that you've set of 110 and keep a safe distance to the vehicle in front of you. If you spend a lot of time on the freeway, as plenty of you do, it's an incredible system that makes a big difference to your daily driving. Now, no matter how well I position that mirror, there's still going to be a blind spot over my rear three quarter on the right hand side. What blind spot monitoring will do is if I put the indicator on and I go to change lanes or make a move, there'll be a flashing light, there'll be a warning of some kind that tells me that there is something in my blind spot. But the third one that we'd like to take a beginner's look at is electronic lane keep assist. Now essentially what that will do is keep you safely within the marked lines. Now that's important for people who might have drifted off or had a micro sleep like we've spoken about and started to move out of their lane and the vehicle will pull you back into the lane and also alert you that it's doing what it's doing. And the crucial element with the Volvo system is that it's not too aggressive, so it's doing whatever it needs to do to keep you safe and you've got no idea that it's doing it. If you're watching Drive Safer, don't forget everything you need to know, that's over at drive.com.au. Volvo is a brand that's synonymous with safety, but that doesn't mean that safety has to be boring. And that's why we sat down with one of the experts from Volvo Australia to find out why their latest vehicles are as safe as they are. When I think Volvo, I do think safety, but I think things like innovations within that, like three-point seat belts and, and things like that. What are some of the developments and inventions that you think Volvo is synonymous for? The seatbelt, obviously, you know, the fact that the patent was left open, so it became something everyone uses. And the, the development of the seatbelt as well. You know, we've gone from just having a belt now to pyrotechnic devices, electric motors, and things like that. But then you've also got, we were the first to develop the um, emergency braking system, which came out standard on the car. Then we added the, the camera into the system, which then opened up a whole world of different scenarios, pedestrian detection, cyclist detection, and things like that. Is there a simple way to differentiate for the, for the viewer who's got no idea what we're talking about, what the difference between active and passive safety is. As from a passive safety point of view, you're talking about the structural integrity of the car, the crash safety that's in it, um, airbags, seatbelts, things like that. When you talk about active safety, you're actually talking about a system that may intervene to assist the driver or um, actually just warn the driver beforehand. Because the idea now is we actually want to stop the crash happening. The, the ability to now have camera and, light and radars in the cars and things like that is what's changed the, the system before. Because now the car can actually be aware of its surroundings, what's around it, can detect the difference between uh, a pedestrian that's about to walk across the road or one that doesn't walk across the road. Because you need to, with these systems, you need to make sure they don't falsely activate. Because that'll be the thing that'll turn people off and start turning them off. Does Volvo see that there's a line between those, that some are more driver assistance and some are more convenience? Yeah, you know, if you look at the blind spot warning, it may not be a safety system for the driver, mm. but it may be a safety system for the motorbike rider that's coming up behind you quickly that you, don't, that you can't quite see in the mirror. Mm. So, you know, there's a protecting the drivers and then also protecting those outside the, the car, vulnerable road users especially. Is that the way that you see it from a Volvo perspective, that the best systems are the ones that do what they need to do, but they're not intrusive? Yeah, and the, the point from our point is that the, the driver is always in control. 
that's the sort of number one fundamental. There's nothing that will take control away from the driver. But there are some situations where you think maybe the driver's not concentrating enough. Um, that's when you'll hear the system or feel the systems come in. Yeah, one of the classics is probably the emergency brake assist, where you know you've hit the brakes uh, very fast and quite unannounced, mm. but you haven't pressed as hard as you can. So the car thinks, well, hang on, you're, you're trying to stop this thing. I'll apply more braking into the car mm. and the car will pull up at the maximum amount of brake pressure it can. And the driver doesn't really feel the difference. Um, and that's probably something where you get the system and actually come in and go, okay, you need a bit of help in this. Because mm. uh, it could be the seating position's not right. A prevention is better than the end, trying to fix the end result situation. So before, make the occupants as safe as possible. So when you crash into the tree, the occupants are safe. Now these technologies are about avoiding you from crashing into tree in the first place. Yeah, exactly. And, and that's what we've looked at with the uh, accident investigation team. You know, so they've looked at, they've been established since 1970. They were investigating all crashes involving Volvos around, the, around Gothenburg. And yeah, that was where the designs for the new R&D came in. We saw the injuries that were happening. And then you start actually looking at, okay, what technologies can we develop, put in place, that will actually then prevent those injuries and sort of becomes what we call the circular life. Can you explain a little bit about the theory of connected technology and, and do you think that's going to play a big part as we move forward? The best example we had was there was a project started in Europe a while ago where we had, they called it slippery road and hazard warning. And the idea was then if a Volvo uh, has its hazard lights on or had lock up because of um, uh, frozen road, was that that signal would be sent back into the Volvo cloud and then would come up as a broadcast in the dash of your car. So, so you actually knew there was a hazard ahead, especially around the corner or something like that. So the idea then to expand that into all the other cars on the network and to the infrastructure mm. is where you start talking. And that's sort of something that will become important for traffic management, um, incident response and things like that. But that's something that people have to work out if they're willing to pay for it. Yeah. Because you know, the more technology goes into the car, the cost changes as well. Is, is that something we have to accept? Just staying with that for one second, the, the more technologically advanced and the smarter the cars get and the more that is in them, they are going to get more expensive, aren't they? I mean, that's kind of the reality of the technology, isn't it? It's like buying a computer. Yeah. You can buy a cheap computer for this or you can go and spend a fortune mm. depending on what you want. So, you know, you look at the, the cars when they start moving to having the um, LiDAR and things like that, the computing power that's needed to actually calculate through that is much more than what it is with radar systems. So again, you know, you're becoming more and more um, reliant on having processing power and things like that, that has power consumption issues. Um, so yeah, you know, you sort of couldn't end up with a car that does everything for you mm. and still expect it to be a, you know, 9990 drive away. We say this all the time at Drive, but the four tyres that are on your vehicle right now, they are your last point of contact between you and your vehicle and the road, and it is vital that you keep them in good condition. Now, you might be watching this and thinking, well, I know how to spot a flat tire, and yes, that's one element of it. But how many of you know how to spot whether a tire is safe and healthy for you still to drive on, and therefore, keeps your vehicle safe as well? Now, sometimes, despite all the advancements in technology and all the modern stuff that we have access to, an old piece of advice is still a good one, and that's exactly what this is. This is a 20-cent piece. I know most of you don't carry as much cash as you used to, and to be honest, we had to go scratching around today to find this one, but it pays to keep a 20-cent piece inside your car, and I'm going to show you why. If you use the reverse side of the coin, and you sit it down inside the tread, nice and square, really easy, just straight down inside the tread block. And if you can see any part of the platypus bill at the bottom, that means that your tyres need to be replaced. Now, it's only a guide, it is pretty basic, but it's a handy, quick, easy way of deciding that you need to replace your tyres. If you're watching Drive Safer, don't forget everything you need to know, that's over at drive.com.au. Welcome back and thanks for watching Drive Safer. Don't forget everything you need to know. That's over at drive.com.au. Now it's time to talk tyre safety, so let's chat to the gurus at Bob Jane T-Marts. With more than 130 stores nationwide, Bob Jane T-Marts is a name that most Aussies know and trust when it comes to fitting new tyres to your car. And that's why we've come here to one of their Sydney outlets to talk to franchisee Steve 
about tyre safety because we take tyre safety very seriously at Drive. I spend a lot of time telling people to make sure you put the right tyre on your vehicle and you don't just go and throw anything on it. Yep. That's an important message, isn't it? Oh, absolutely. There's other factors that come into it. There's a budget and so forth, but on your high-end cars, you've really got to put what comes off it. Yeah. Or there or thereabouts. With your your average type, you know, your mum and dad type car, mm. really, there's the branded tyres are well priced, mm -hmm. and we tend to find that that they sell quite they sell themselves basically. If I don't drive around like a yobbo and I drive the car reasonably smoothly, what sort of lifespan can I expect? Look, generally, thirty five to forty thousand kilometres. Okay. If you had to pick two, what are the two big things that are going to be most affected if your tyres are well past their use by date? Well. The braking, yeah. your braking. That's the big one, right? That's the big one for me. Yeah. And it's wet weather. It's wet weather where it's all going to come into play. Mm -hmm. In the dry, you'll get away with it, you'll sneak away with it here and there. What you'll cop then is more punch repairs. Mm -hmm. Number two is if the police catch you, you're in a lot of trouble. Yeah, that's true. A lot and of people then, don't think of that. And then there's the insurance factor mm. where you have a big smash, it's your fault, and mm. insurance company might say sorry. If your tyres are... If yeah. your tyres are uh, illegal. So it's a serious issue, right? You know, without doubt, without question. My parents always said to me, check your tyres every two weeks. I notice you recommend on the website every two weeks. So is that good advice for people? It is, yeah. but I look at our lifestyles. Mm -hmm. right? Everyone's busy, everyone's doing this, mm -hmm. rushing around. Realistically, I think once a month's fine. The majority of customers come in and say, I need new tyres for my car. Yeah. And the thing you hear more than anything else is, what's the cheapest? Yeah. You shouldn't be thinking, what's my cheapest option here? You should be thinking, what's my best option? Is that right? Yes, yeah, absolutely. But we try and educate them as well by saying, look, they're going to cost you X amount. Yep. You spend a bit more, you get this. Mm -hmm. They last longer. The last longer thing gets them. Mm -hmm. oh, it lasts longer. It's going to handle better. Mm -hmm. It's going to last longer. I check spare tyres all the time, probably because I've driven so many old cars that are unreliable. Yeah. And that you get a flat and then you go to put the spare on and it's flat, it's, it's got no wear in it. Do people generally forget that? Yeah, you, you, sh you should check your, your precious good practice. Oh, good, yeah. Oh, God, yeah. Because <laughs> if you're out in the country and you get a flat tyre, that one that's in your boot that, or under the back of the car, that's all you've that's got. That's not right, you're in a fair bit of trouble. Yeah, OK. But I think that's why, this is why they've introduced the space saver. Mm. Because once it goes on the car, it looks ugly, it yep. looks wrong. It makes you... <laughs> it makes the people get the tyre fixed. I'd never thought of that. Even more so post the COVID-19 pandemic and lockdowns, more Australians than ever are buying a caravan or a camper trailer and hitting the road on what we've always called the Great Aussie Road Trip. Now, we at Drive think that towing skill is something that should be added to your licence. There's no specific test that you have to do anywhere in this country to learn or attain the skills that's required to be able to safely tow a caravan. Therefore, if you head off on a drive around Australia and the first time you've towed anything is with a big caravan behind you, you could come into a whole bunch of issues. So we decided to visit an Australian owned company, New Age Caravans, to talk to the experts and find out a little bit more, not just about caravans and what they mean and how they work, but some of the techniques that you should keep in mind when you're behind the wheel. So speaking on a really entry level basis, you've bought a caravan like this, you're a complete novice. What are some of the common mistakes that beginners make that you can avoid? Look, I think with, with your driving techniques, you do have to adjust them because when you're actually putting a caravan on the back of a car, yep. it actually changes the dynamics of the car completely. Mm -hmm. So in regards to braking distances, you need to allow yourself more braking distance um, between the car in front of you. Mm -hmm. Also in conditions where you've got water on the road, you've got to allow distances further again. Yep. So it does change the driving dynamics of the car completely. You know, if you've got a rough road, yep. you drive to the conditions. Now, if you think you can do 120 towing a caravan on a rough road, yeah. it's not going to happen. It's going to end up in a disaster. So it's more about ed educating the people that are towing to drive to the conditions. A lot of people think about rain, road conditions, lighting, animals, things like that. Yep. One that sneaks up on you when you're towing a caravan, and it's ironic because outside today it's pretty windy, is it wind. Is. is wind, right? Absolutely. So in a lot of situations around Australia, particularly mountain ranges and 
bridges, yep. the wind picks up the back of the caravan, yep. and then once you get that swaying motion happening, it's like a pendulum, mm. and then, yeah, it gets out of control. Very simply, if you can feel it doing that while you're driving, what, what's the first thing that you should do? The first thing you should do is really take your foot off the accelerator. Right. Don't panic. Yep. A lot of people, unfortunately, it's it all happens in a split second. They put their foot on the brake, yep. and then within a second, it's, it's all over. Right. Should you need an endorsement or some kind of licence certification in order to enable you to be able to tow? Absolutely. Yeah. There should be a course that is developed where someone needs to uh, do before you actually tow on a caravan. What I would suggest to first time caravanners is mm. to find a car park that no one's in. Yep. Go with your wife and practise reversing the caravan, even buy some cones mm. and then practise reversing into the cones and out of the cones. Yep. At a very basic level, are there some common mistakes that beginners make, you think? But the most common mistake will be not hitching and locking the hitch on the actual car. So what happens is they go over a bump and that actually comes off and bang, right. hits the ground. Everyone will connect the chains properly, whether you put them in parallel or cross, mm -hmm. they'll be connected. But the most common one is, is that the actual hitch is not locked in. The other one is also too not loading the van correctly. All right. So not putting the correct weight. So when you're looking at a van, say that it weighs two and a half tonne, the bore weight should be about 10% of that should sure. be about 250 kilos. Yep. Now, you know, Mr. and Mrs. Brown go away for the for the for a holiday with a the family, they load up the caravan, mm -hmm. they put too much weight at the back of the van. Right. Ultimately it puts on a light tow ball weight and right. that's what leads into swaying. So that that is a very common thing that happens. What I say to customers, the best way to work out your weights is put everything that you need in the caravan mm -hmm. and you're ready to go to a holiday, yep. then take it over to a public way bridge. Weigh the van, make sure that you haven't exceeded your ATM. Mm -hmm. And also the other important thing is to actually check the bore weight. Because with our current modern cars, you can't exceed 350 kilos downforce on the bore weight. Mm -hmm. If they do that, they're gonna be off on a, on a good note. If you're watching Drive Safer, don't forget everything you need to know, that's over at drive.com.au. We talk a lot about modern vehicles and how much they've evolved, especially in a safety sense when you're towing. And this new Ford Ranger, perfect example of it. Down here with this dial, you can slide that around to the tow haul mode, and that sets up all of the electronics, things like throttle sensitivity and steering, tweaks, all of that to suit having a trailer on the back. Then the other benefit is through the infotainment system here, you can go into a towing specific page and it tells you whether you've got an active trailer connected to the tow ball. The other thing that it does that I think is just genius is it runs you through a towing connection checklist. So it ticks everything off. Is it connected properly? Are the safety chains on? Are the electrics set up correctly? Do all the lights work? All that simple stuff. And then of course, what you can do is add trailer profiles. So say you've got a trailer with two jet skis on it, you've got a camper trailer, and you've got a car trailer. You can add those trailer profiles in here. You select whichever trailer you're using once it's set up. It makes everything incredibly easy. Most importantly, makes everything incredibly safe. Buying a brand new caravan and heading off on the great Australian road trip. It's something that so many Aussies want to do and it's absolutely vital that you do it in safety. We're going to have a chat to the Australian owned company New Age Caravans to find out exactly what you need to know. This vehicle has electric brakes fitted to it obviously because we're towing quite a large van. Yep. Um, Adjusting the electric brakes to work the way that you would like them to work, is that a, a, just getting a feel for it? Yes, it is. It's getting a feel. So if you make it too sensitive, what happens is you end up locking the wheels on the back. Yep. And if it's not sensitive enough, you can actually, when you apply the brakes, you can actually feel the caravan pushing Push the car right. a lot harder. So the, the way to adjust the brake controller is that when you actually apply the brakes, that when the car is slowing down, it's like you haven't got the caravan at the back because it's applying the same braking force at the back as well. And when you're applying the brakes, you want to apply the brakes gradually. You don't want to just suddenly jerk on the brakes and come to a slow a slow stop. I've noticed you're very actively 
adjusting the gap in front of you. Correct. Because people have a tendency in Australia, and, and it's a pet hate of mine, you position yourself to the car in front of you. This is even when you're not towing. Yeah, well, look, see, so I position myself to allow myself plenty of room come in. that someone just cuts in, <laughs> and then what I will do is I'll adjust my yes. con uh, driving conditions and I'll allow that, That's right. that space so in between us. you're always actively measuring that distance. Correct. We've talked on this uh, episode of Drive TV about towing, towing safety. It can be as simple as a, a tradie or a, a lawn maintenance um, box trailer with some yeah. gear in it, right up to a big caravan or a horse float or a race car or something yeah. like that. If you're towing and you're towing long distances, should you expect that the tyres on your tow vehicle are going to wear out a little bit quicker? In a general sense, yes. Okay. But if you you need to watch your tyre presses mm -hmm. and you need to get that right. Yep. And you need to put a high applied tyre, like with the stronger sidewall, yep. which will allow the weight to, yep. to hold better. Mm -hmm. And I, I think also the distribution of weight, mm -hmm. I think, comes into play with it as well. Yep. You'll see them towing and, you know, the back's down and yep. the front's down the other one. Yep. That's going to cause you problems. But I think if, the, if that part gets levelled out, mm -hmm. it should increase your tyre weight, yeah. One of the things that just annoys me is when people put stupid rims on the wrong car. Yeah. One of the current ones you see a lot, because there's so many SUVs on the road, is you buy an SUV that's got a 17 and 18 inch rim on it. Someone goes and puts a 20, a 22 inch rim. Yeah. Small sidewall, yeah. low profile tire. You, you just cannot assume that that tire on that wheel is going to allow that vehicle to do what it would have done with the standard wheels and tires on it, right? Yeah, that's a great, great question. Look, it's it's it doesn't work. Low profile and yep. four wheel driving, yep. you're in trouble. Yep. You, you'll bend wheels, mm -hmm. you'll split tires, and it's just not right. Now, driving safely isn't all about technology and the vehicle and tires. What it's also about is how you pack your vehicle. That's right, Australians head off on the road and there's all sorts of stuff just thrown haphazardly into the boot. We're going to show you some quick tips to make sure you pack your vehicle safely. Now, if you're anything like me and you own a bunch of old cars that are incredibly unreliable, which is the exact opposite of this Volvo, this thing here is your best friend. It's a mobile battery pack, but it's also very heavy. And it's a perfectly good example for us to use to illustrate that when you're loading heavy things into the back of your vehicle, you want them low down and as close to the axle line as possible. So you're gonna put that battery pack right up there. It's up against the seat backs. Now, the reason that you do that is because you might not think, but something that weighs even 20 kilograms, if it's up high and it's not secured and you have to use an emergency braking manoeuvre and that 20 kilogram object goes flying through the cabin, it can do a hell of a lot of damage. It can hit occupants in the back of the head. It could even kill people. So you need to keep that secure. Keep your stuff down low, push it as far forward as you can, have light objects like pillows and blankets and stuff up high because if they go flying forward, they won't damage anybody in the cabin. Now, the other thing that you really should consider if you've got a wagon or an SUV and you load it up regularly is a cargo barrier behind the seats. Most manufacturers have them as options or there are usually aftermarket solutions. And something like this cargo barrier itself, which is not the most complex thing in the world, this is your friend because that keeps everything down and out of the way and there's a sturdy bar at the back there. Pack your car safely, put your heavy objects close towards the axle line and as low down as possible, you'll be able to hit the road safely. Well, up to this point on Drive Safer, we've focused on the vehicle and safe use of the vehicle when you're out on a road trip. Now it's time to switch gears though and focus on the person behind the wheel. That's right, you, the driver. The very nature of the size of our amazing country means that road trips can be long and quite frankly, planning for fatigue should be something that you put into your planning before you even head off on the road. Can somebody share the driving duties? Do you feel safe driving at night? Is there somewhere you can stop? These are all questions you should be asking yourself before you hit the road. In a recent report that we read, we saw the alarming statistic that nearly a third of Australians had experienced a micro sleep while driving. Now that on its own is a terrifying thought, but when you account for the fact that nearly 1,200 Australians lose their lives on the road every year, it's absolutely not worth putting anybody at risk, you or any other road user, if you're fatigued or you feel tired. Don't let your lack of sleep put anybody else at risk on the road. 
you're watching Drive Safer, don't forget everything you need to know. That's over at drive.com.au. Advanced driver courses, or what we like to call driver skill courses, are part and parcel of something that we do at Drive just about every day. However, for a lot of you watching at home, you may never have even thought of enrolling in one. Now, we've come to Western Sydney International Dragway to meet with a guy that is synonymous with putting skilled drivers on the road. Ian Luff has been doing this for decades. He's been advocating that governments and everybody involved get more and more support behind advanced and skilled driver training courses. Let's find out what Luffy's got to say about how you can stay safer on the road. Ian, you and I could stand here all day talking about safety. Some people find it boring, I don't. Can you tell people watching now, you know, four or five really common mistakes that people make behind the wheel that they probably don't even realise they're making? Probably the number one would be tailgating. Yep. Now, a lot of people don't believe they're tailgating, yet 30% of the crashes we see on Australian roads are people travelling too close. Right. Because, as you know, it takes a certain amount of time to stop a vehicle, mm. um, given reaction time and, and so forth. Yep. So that's number one. Number two would have to be seating position in yeah, the car. Sure. We all come in different shapes and sizes and, and modern vehicles have got an array of adjustment, yeah. even steering wheels, yeah. up, down, in, yeah. out. Yet a lot of people think it's a one size fits all mm -hmm. and, and that can impact on driver fatigue because we've got the wrong posture, yep. there's the problem. That then relates to the big one that is my pet hate, is rear view mirrors. Now, as we know, with trucks, they've got mirrors, they've got signs on the back, you know, if you can't see me, I can't see you. Yet so many people have their mirrors adjusted so they can see the side of the car. Ah, yes. That shows you the impact when the person's got you. Yeah. <laughs> so the further off the vehicle, you're actually getting rid of what's commonly called the blind spot. When you look at number four, mm. it's people actually over-braking at the end of the stop. Right. As we know, at any speed, your maximum speed is at the beginning and when you're stationary, you're stationary. Mm -hmm. So you need all of your braking here and yep. not at the end. Yep. And yet people, um, they tend to over-brake to the end and all the passengers nod their heads with approval. <laughs> right. And the, 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 fi well. the final one, I guess you could sit back and say, nobody owns the road. Mm. We have to share the roads with everyone else. There is a bit of an entitlement that's crept into the way we drive, especially yeah. in the big cities, isn't there? Well, people think it's self-entitlement. I own the car, yeah. I own that piece of road. Mm -hmm. I mean, people are allowed to push in, mm -hmm. supposedly for safety, but what we've got to look at is it's all about your attitude. With modern vehicles as technologically advanced as they are, we're not as aware behind the wheel because the car is doing more for us. People say a driver's getting worse because the cars are getting better. A lot of drivers use drive time as think time. Yeah. Think about everything else. In other words, they externalise sure. their thoughts outside the vehicle itself. Sure. Yep. So while the manufacturers are doing a fabulous job giving us all this wonderful safety, active safety and so forth, what about the driver? Mm. I think also vehicle manufacturers need to take a level of responsibility too to sort of say, maybe do more with their customers. To educate. In other words, educate yeah. them about the advanced mm -hmm. technologies yep how it functions and all those sort of things there. So then we're going to have better, safer drivers on our roads. And I think at the end of the day, that's what everybody wants. I use the term driver development. Yep. And if you use the term defensive, a lot of people get offensive when you use the word <laughs> defensive, which right. is crazy. Yep. But governments have to understand that every day there are good people out there driving and they're not crashing. Mm. Now, it's the minority people, the ratbags out there that think the roads are racetracks, illegal street racing, we see crashes all the time happening, but most people don't even understand the rules. So we're in the business of driver development, changing attitudes, behaviour, which is based on choice. I had an alarming conversation a few years ago with a representative from one of the big caravan manufacturers. And they said to me that something around 90% of their customers, the first time they've towed anything is when they tow their new caravan out of the dealership. I think we need a whole separate training course and skill set for people who are going to be towing big trailers. Well, you've only got to look at the trucking industry because you've touched on a really like, can of worms. Yeah. And a good example is also at the local boat ramp. Yes. Go there on a Saturday yeah, and watch yeah. people trying to reverse. <laughs> they have no idea yeah. until they've actually done it. Mm. And we're putting people on the road and again, governments need to take responsibility for the massive road toll and the conditions that are out there, mm. they're not doing anything about changing it. So it's time for change. But the reality is that is symbolic of a bigger issue, which is a serious safety issue when you're out on the road, because chances are 
If you don't understand what the trailer is doing behind you when you're reversing it, you're not going to understand what it's doing behind you when you need to brake in an emergency when you're going forward. Well, that's right. I mean, the person heading up, say, uh, towards Queensland from Sydney, mm -hmm. you know, Pacific High, lovely motorway, they're allowed to tow at 100 kilometres an hour. Mm. But what if they've got to stop? Yeah. The first time they've done it is when they've actually done it. Mm. And they have no idea all of that mass mm. that's pushing it forward. Yep. It requires a huge amount of space. Mm. Motor cars, as we said, don't discriminate, that's whether true. it's caravan on the back or a boat. Mm -hmm. People need to take responsibility for their actions. So a thinking driver is a surviving driver. I like that. On the subject of towing, beyond something light, like a box trailer, should we be saying you need more training if you want to tow big vans, horse floats, boats, whatever it might be? 110% correct. Mm. Really must do because it is a serious matter. Yep. When it goes wrong, it goes wrong. Very wrong, yeah. And people are not aware and they don't know what to do. So training or mm -hmm. better training, mm -hmm. skill sets, awareness, all go together. If you're watching Drive Safer, don't forget everything you need to know, that's over at drive.com.au. So Ian, you're going to show us a couple of emergency stops now. Um, and I think this is really important because a lot of people think 40 kilometres an hour is too slow. There's a reason that we have 40k an hour in a school zone, right? And it's because kids are unpredictable. They can just run out onto the road. Young children, it's been proven, have got no spatial awareness. Right. They've got no peripherals or anything like that. The ball runs on the road, mm. they target the ball, yep. they race out. So let's look at 40 kilometres an hour in a school zone. Yep. And I'm going to stop at the first set of cones and okay. put the brakes on. And I'm going to do a full ABS stop. So the speed in this lovely car is going to come up nicely. Oh, seatbelts came on time. Wow, as well. you could feel that pre-tension <laughs> in the seatbelt. Yeah. Yeah. Now we pulled up incredibly short. That's so, that's just under a car length. Yeah. Basically. Let's just up the speed. We'll go from 40 to 80. Now there are some people that have an attitude. Oh, look, I'm coming home from work. You know, oh, it's a 40k zone. It's okay to do 60 or mm. 70 or even 80. Mm. We've seen that recorded. Yeah. It's absolutely dangerous. Right. We've got to get our head around it to think. Speed zones are there for a reason. So, yep. okay, we bring the speed up. There's 80k. Yep. Ooh, right. Now, so, that was stopping in 26 metres. Hazard lights are flashing, <laughs> which is another safety feature here, warning people behind, hey, I've just done an emergency stop. Mm. And speed is proportional to distance. So, okay, let's take it further and let's go to the legal speed limit and yep. try one at 100 kilometres per hour. It has to be proportional. We're going to take the stopping distance a lot further. And that's why 30% of uh, accidents on our roads are people running up the back of people because yep. they don't have enough space to stop in. And people say, oh, but if I leave a gap, someone will push in. Mm. We don't own the road. And we don't own the road. And to th that point as well, just before you do the 100 kilometre one, this is a brand new car on high quality tyres at the right tyre pressure with everything up to date, brakes serviced, all that sort of stuff. If you're driving a 10 year old car and your tyres are a little bit worn or your brakes aren't brand new, it, it goes even further, right? Well, that's right. And people have to remember, tyres are the last point of contact yeah. between us and the road. You're responsible for the air pressure in the tyres. Sure. Because no matter how good the tyre is, lack of air pressure is not a good look. OK, so let's get our speed up. OK, there we are. Verification with you. Yep, 100 k's an hour. 100 k. Right at the first cone. Yep. Wow. And as you can see now, forget driver reaction yeah. time. Mm. That was being proactive. That was physical stopping distance. This lovely new Volvo pulls up brilliantly. Mm. But we can see the faster we go, the more space we need. <laughs> Absolutely, a lot more. So tell me what we've got here, mate. You put it in D for dream, as we said, <laughs> but we're not going to sleep. We're actually going to pay attention to what we're doing here. And this looks to me like a, a slalom that you would set up, right? Well, all motor manufacturers around the world like to look at vehicle dynamics. In mm -hmm. other words, a simple term, vehicle balance. Yep. As we know, with lateral movement in a vehicle, that's commonly called body roll. Mm -hmm. Virtually none in this vehicle. Mm -hmm. And then we've got the forward and aft pitch of the vehicle controlled by braking or acceleration. So what we're really looking for here is to try and get some dynamic response with regards to throttle, yep. which is to do with the balance of the car. Mm -hmm. So I want to go through fairly slowly to start with, but 
as I look through here, I'm looking for the gap, not at the product itself, not the hat. Oh, I see so what you're saying. So a bit of acceleration there. So you're doing just under 40 k's an hour, give or take. And you can feel every time I touch the accelerator, yep. this Volvo's got beautiful response. Yes. And it's actually making the car sit very flat. Now, at that speed, everything is fairly normal. Yes. So when we increase speed, we start increasing the load on the vehicle itself. In mm -hmm. other words, the vehicle dynamics. Yep. You're touching the accelerator as we're in the middle of the curve, just to sort of get it to the speed that you want it to be at. Exactly. But what I'll do now, I'll just change things up a little bit. Yep. I'll accelerate around the cone. Oh, yeah, I can feel... Oh, yeah, I can feel that, yes. That's changed the language of what the car's doing completely, now, hasn't I'm doing, it? I'm doing the same speed. Yeah, isn't and, that interesting? And yet, as a passenger, you could feel that. I'm getting moved around a lot more. Correct, because I'm creating lateral force on yeah. my car because I'm accelerating at the wrong time. What we'll do is we'll just step the speed just a little bit more. Yep. So I'm accelerating across the cone. Yeah, you can, all, you can feel straight away it's getting a lot more physical in what the car's doing. You can, you can, now you could feel. Yeah. There was a little intervention yeah, there yeah, yeah. of what's called stability control. Right. Okay. Now I can see that you are smiling then, so that's a, <laughs> that's a good sign. <laughs> smiling because we made it safely because we're in exactly. safe hands. <laughs> but the intervention of the electronics then was quite interesting because mm. the car started to get a little bit more, let's say, agitated, mm -hmm. and it actually applied the braking electronically. Yeah. So the car's actually smarter than the driver. Smarter than the driver. <laughs> Thanks for watching Drive Safer. As you can tell, we take safety very seriously here at Drive, and we're gonna do something in terms of an initiative. That's why I've got Drive's Director of Content, James Ward here. Wardy, what are we gonna do? Yeah, thanks Trent, and I think it's one of these things, everyone at Drive is very passionate about road safety, and if you're anything like us, you look at what's happening, you think, well, what can I do? to make a difference, which is why we are going to campaign for a, uh, a nationally recognised towing endorsement to be applied to driver's licences, which means that you need to be appropriately trained and endorsed to tow anything that requires a brake trailer. Now, to find out more and to have your say, you can scan the QR code on screen or head on over to drive.com.au with all the information presented for you. Absolutely right. And the last point to make is don't make the mistake of thinking that it's not going to happen to you. Mm. We're all out on the roads. We've got to be as safe as possible. As Wardy said, everything you need to know, that's over at drive.com.au. And in the meantime, when you're out on your family road trip, drive safer.